morning, everybody. Um, I got here early. Kind of fun. I, our, our building, the Hospitality Learning Center, you'll be there this afternoon, is, is over three buildings. I rarely come over here in my chef outfit. Well, we have, uh, I guess from Alex's department, we have a bunch of students that are helping us out and uh, ambassadors, if you will. So I walk out of the room and this one girl looks, she looks at me, she says, are you a chef? I said, no, but I play one on TV. So um, uh, in any event, um, it's kind of funny. Then I said to her, I said, by the way, I said, I'm looking for the little chef's room. She looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, never mind. So in any event, um, uh, uh, today I'm here to give a presentation on uh, uh, overcoming those obstacles of getting a class online. And I'm, I am such a person that said, this class can never be taught online. But in today's academic world, we are challenged to that. We are looking to attract distant, long distance learners. We're looking to attract people that can attend class in off hours. And in my department, we've seen a lot of growth in the last couple of years, so I, so I was challenged to, uh, to put that together. Um, when a class has been uh, taught in a classroom environment, this perception is that this class can't be converted to an online class. And I think that's a lot of the resistance that we see sometimes in converting classes uh, uh, to the online environment. So what are those obstacles? In fact, we'll just do a quick, you know, what are some of the obstacles in putting a class online? Anybody? Yes? Fear of failure compared to success in the classroom. Fear of failure, that's a great one. Okay, what else? Yes, sir? That the skills are not transferable. They're of a practical nature. Okay. Oh, so, so in other words, and, and without that one-on-one -on -one contact, how do you know how they're doing? Yes, sir? For me teaching Spanish, language online, it's okay. hard to make them practice unless it's with me one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, that's a good one, sir. That uh, it's hard to, to do all the work to put it online and no one's going to pay me to do that. Okay. <laughs> good point. But you know what I just did? I went from teaching four online classes to two, uh, rather I went from four in class to two in class and two online. It was my pleasure to convert this. So, but anyway, but I, but, but I was the one that recognized the value of the in-class environment. You had a comment also. But it's not as effective as the face-to-face. -face. Not as effective, okay. Well, a couple of things that I put up here. Um, in our environment, we had too many guest speakers. In fact, we had guest speakers. You know, I, I teach hospitality, service, food-related classes, and so we would have uh, the cheese specialist, the chicken specialist, the produce specialist, the urban spice guy. And as these people came in, I'm thinking, how do we, we've got this valuable experience, we can't lose that. Um, we take field trips. So as a result, now I'm in the online environment, how do I make that happen? Oh, meet me on the corner of such and such. Well, you know, I actually, that doesn't work in the online environment. Students sign up for the online environment because they can't meet me someplace. That's the whole idea. Um, in class, we have sometimes projects or group work, okay? Well, then how do we maintain that connectivity in the online environment, okay? More personal. <laughs> the students are gonna be missing my lectures. And so I think sometimes when we have complete ownership of a in-class uh, curriculum, we just, okay, all right, I gotta convert this online. I can't make two hour videos of myself for every week the class is in session. And that is the next natural thing people think. I did have a student that wrote to me and she said, this is the first week of this semester, she said, where are your three hour long videos week after week? And I had to go back and explain to the student, that's not what we do here. But there is enough rigor in there, we'll keep her busy, that's for sure. Um, sometimes we think I am the class. And you know, it was sometimes especially when we get into a very specialized field, well, this can't be duplicated. It's all about me. So those are some of the obstacles in addition to some of the suggestions that you made as well. This is a quote from me 
But before I teamed up with Alex and Scott Hauk and the two teams from the ETC, I felt that the experiences in my classroom were too powerful and they should never be eliminated or replaced. So, but here's the truth. Uh, in my department, well, we've seen a lot of growth in the last five years. We have a brand new building. It was a, uh, cost a lot of money. But because of that new building, it has created a lot of interest in our program. And as a result, uh, our numbers have really increased. I like that picture because, you know, be behind every good student, there's a good instructor. <laughs> and, um, and I, you know, we, we didn't pose for that. That just happened to be taken. But that's a, that's a great, uh, great picture. In any event, uh, the class that I'm talking about today, it's called Food Fundamentals. And I can remember three years ago, we only had two sections. And then we went to three. And then we went to four. And, and I, I'm kind of the program coordinator for the restaurant management team. So I've got to keep hiring people to come into the classroom. I've got to train them to make sure that all the instructors for all the sections are in lockstep. And so anyway, I was really challenged. And when we hit six sections, my boss said, well, what are you going to do when you hit eight sections? And so we really tried to think about the fact that we were growing exponentially and how are we going to handle that growth? Okay. Um, when we move into an online environment, we have specific challenges. Okay. First thing is, when you're in a regular classroom, oh, uh, OK, in week three, we'll do this. Week five, we do this. Well or in class one or class three or class five. Now that we're in the online environment, throw days and weeks out the window. We don't use those terms. And now we use the word modules. So I've taken this class and I've converted it to a, from a 15 week course to a 15 module course. And we do, the, do it that way. This allows students, if they want to, they can speed ahead. They can go faster than the calendar that I've created. And I've got a couple of students that do that. In fact, I have one student. I recognize in week three that she was going twice the speed. And she was already in module six. And she was the one that would say, hey, Chef Lamb, uh, the quiz I just took, this answer, I gave you the right answer, but you marked it wrong. And I'm thinking overachiever. And so I said to this student, I said, I'll tell you what, you're obviously blazing a trail here faster than anybody else. Work with me on this. You're going to be the first one to trip over every quiz that I've created. Give me feedback. And I can change those quizzes before my other 63 students get there. It was a great pact that I made with a student. And uh, now I've got a great relationship with her. Um, Modules need to, uh, need to contain a certain amount of rigor. Some of the comments we got earlier was that, you know, whether it's the Spanish class or whatever, how do we know that they're doing the work and they're, they're staying on track? And did we as teachers put enough rigor in there? Um, a module, it can contain a brief two minute video overview of the module. We'll talk about those in a little bit. A uh, corresponding PowerPoint presentation, a guest speaker, perhaps that has been videotaped, um, a discussion thread based on that video. Maybe there's a research assignment as well. Uh, perhaps a class-related YouTube or other type of video. So when we start putting these tools together, we have the opportunity to create an online environment that probably, from a time commitment perspective, mirrors the in-class environment. So that's how we get set up there. Oh, and of course, an assessment. That's the new word for tests. And uh, so of course, we're going to have some sort of an assessment at the end of each module so that we can ensure that the students are um, learning what we hope they are. Okay. So the real question here in this environment, how do you maintain a personality and a presence in a class that never meets? Okay. How do you create links so the students can connect the dots? You know, when we are in class based, there is visual recognition, there is voice recognition every single week. Hi, Susie. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Tommy. And we have that kind of interaction. 
In the online environment, we lose that to a certain degree. And, but as the teacher, we, I still want to maintain that relationship. So, um, of course, I think we all recognize that we can't bring the student into the classroom. So we've got to take the classroom and take it to the student. That's really how we try to set that up, okay? So one of the components I said in a good module is a video overview of that module. So the ETC Center, uh, and Alex, it's his fault. He, he encouraged me, create 15 very short videos to introduce each module. And I said, what? <laughs> and so as a result, with Alex's coaching, he said, you know, the thing is, he said, unless they ha can put a face to the name, they're not going to know who you are. And so at, um, with the help of the ETC staff, I created 15 selfies in uh, different venues. I wore different uniforms. I was in different kitchens with different subject matters. And real quick, how did I do this? Well, last year I was the proud recipient of an iPad 2. You can't do PowerPoint on it. You can't do Excel. You can't do Word. But it takes pretty cool pictures. And you can check your email. But it's the picture <laughs> capability and it's the video capability that I tapped into. And so I probably could have set it up with, uh, with Adrian here on the camera or with Scott Houck. Meet me 15 different times and let's do 15 different videos. But I recognize that I could do this by myself. And so literally what I did 15 different times, I would take my little uh, iPad, in fact, it's already, it's already cute, in fact, I can do this right now. We can take a, a, a selfie with you guys here. Um, but then what I would do is I would put it like here, or I would put it on a shelf, or I would put it in the refrigerator, and then I would just go up and I would turn it on and I would say, hi, it's Jackson Lane. And um, a quick side story, I have to tell you this. At home, I have a refrigerator, and I've got a number of different name tags that have my name on them from different organizations I'm a part of. My grandson's over six months ago. Unbeknownst to me, he takes every name tag and puts it on his T-shirt, and he's walking around the house, hi, I'm Jackson Lamb. Hi, I'm Jackson Lamb. <laughs> the funniest thing I ever saw. So, in any event, we created selfies um, that, that helped introduce each module. Okay, this is the first step in linking the teacher to the student. Okay, here's an example of a two minute video. Uh, you can make this, you can insert this yourself. I did this in our storeroom. Good afternoon everybody, it's Chef Jackson Lamb. I'm here in the storeroom of the Hospitality Learning Center. And again, we're talking about Hospitality uh, HTE 1533, Food Fundamentals. Today, let me just check my notes so that we're accurate. Today, um, I'm introducing module number 13, which is potatoes, grains, and pastas. It also aligns with chapter 22 in the uncooking textbook. So with that, I'm in the pasta and grain section. Just to give you an idea of some of the products that come through here at Metro State. I've got lasagna, I've got elbow macaroni, I've got uh, quinoa, we've got, uh, uh, it looks like there's fafali pasta, there's penne pasta, there's lasagna over here, I think I said that already. I've got small shells. We've got rice, we've got aborio rice, short grain rice, we have brown rice. We've got just about every type of grain or pasta that's out on the market. So uh, in our teachings and our classes, you'll be exposed to most grains. I won't say all, but most grains, okay? Uh, we're also, uh, in this chapter, you're gonna learn about potatoes. Colorado is potato country, so you'll learn about fingerling potatoes, you'll learn about russets, red potatoes, yellow potatoes, white potatoes, and all of the different sizes that come with that. So, with chapter 22, pastas, grains, and potatoes, it's Stark City. A lot of times in diets, these are going away, but they're still a vibrant part of the food uh, sources that we teach. So, happy cooking, everybody. Thank you very much. I did that all by myself in, in a closet. <laughs> it's really what I did. You know, uh, and not to distract you either, but you know, this is the text that we're using. Could you just go ahead and pass that around? But this is a big book. And part of what we talked about earlier is rigor. And so, as I have created, let me go backwards. So a year ago, 
We would be in an in-class environment using a book like this. We think the students are going to read the book, okay? After this class, the next series is called Food Science, and it's a cooking class. And we found the students would be coming in and maybe not as prepared as they needed to be. They didn't know the difference between bok choy and Napa cabbage. They didn't know, uh, they didn't know their product identification and selection like they should have, okay? We rolled this first uh, semester out in summer, and in the fall semester, my, uh, my uh, cooking chef said, hey, the students are getting smarter. And I think it's because the 64 students that took this online during the summer were actually, we held their feet to the fire. They had to uh, read these chapters. Here's a great one. I have a student, it's the second week of school. She said, listen, I just took that quiz online and I didn't do very well. And as a matter of fact, not all that information is in the PowerPoint. <laughs> and I said, no, it's not. You'll actually have to read the textbook. And I had a couple of students that said, okay, you're right. I, I didn't read the text. I just read the PowerPoints. So now we've created a dub, another dynamic that makes them accountable. If you're already using PowerPoints in your class, those same PowerPoints can come into this. Um, in fact, I've got a couple of modules where we cover three different chapters and there's three different PowerPoints in there. All the PowerPoint is, as you know, it's just an abbreviation of what the chapter really does represent. But um, again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I took all the existing PowerPoints that I had and I just incorporated them into my modules, okay? Um, our department has been recording guest speakers for a number of years. Um, and so we were sitting on probably 20 different videos. Um, here's Martin Jan, he came in last year. Jan can, he says, Jan can cook, and you can't. So uh, uh, he was charming, but, um, but we had this treasure trove of resources, okay? Um, so I don't know how it is where you teach, but you know, when we had two sections, okay, we've got the spice guy coming in. Well, I need you to not just to do the one class, you gotta do the both classes. We can't give one class preferential treatment. Oh, and the other class, forget it, we're not gonna do that. So, if my spice guy couldn't do the second class, I had to find another spice guy, okay? I had to find another chicken guy, I had to find, it got to the point that chicken people wouldn't even call me back anymore, because they knew <laughs> it was five sections. So anyway, as a result, when you've only got two or three sections, it's a little bit easier. But as you start to grow your program, it does become problematic. And how do you do a, uh, a guest speaker in one class and not in the other? Okay, we can make them watch a movie. Well, that's actually what we do in the online environment, but is that fair to a student that is actually coming to campus to an online class that, okay, I have to go to class today and watch a movie? So having speakers that come and talk to all the sections, that's fairly standard in most institutions, but with growth, it becomes problematic, okay? Uh, Martin Yan was so funny here. He was holding up chopsticks. He was saying, uh, this is a Chinese dietary tool, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny because I can not use chopsticks. Um, so in any event, we took, uh, we took the best videos that we had. We loaded those up into Blackboard. That becomes required watching online. So we put that together. In fact, when we do this, the ETC team, they come in and they will close caption all these videos, which is required for ADA. So uh, the ETC does that, so we're in compliance, which is fantastic. So here's an example of what we do with such a video, okay? We had a video of a cheesemonger. I love that word, I wanted to just throw that up there. But uh, Jim Arnold is our guy here, and he ran a cheese shop uh, in Cherry Creek, and uh, uh, in any event, he came in and he, uh, guest speaker, uh, he brought in different types of cheeses for tasting and we gave the students, let me back up, he came in, we recorded it, I'm gonna show you the video in a little bit, but we wanted to use this video in the online environment, okay? So, in the online environment, I kinda created this, I said, I suggest that you purchase small quantities of the seven to eight types of cheese listed below and eat along with the original class. 
pretty cool. And then what we really try to do is we try to break it up so it's, it's, it's different varieties. And did anybody happen to bring cheese? <laughs> Actually, I did. So we're um, trying to duplicate what we're doing at home. So if you can help me out there, I've got 40 samples of cheese here. And, and, and I'll tell you what, what I've got for you. I've got a blue cheese in here. I've got a Gruyere in there. There's a cheddar. And it's not listed here, but it's Parmesan. And so all of them are distinct. You'll know which one is which, OK? But can you imagine I create an assignment like this Okay, you better, go out, you better go out and buy those cheeses. Well, not everybody can, and I don't expect everybody to. But I had a student that responded to me, and she said, you know, I got, la I got married last year. On our honeymoon, we went to France. I'd never been in a wine and cheese pairing until my honeymoon, and we were in Paris, and we went to a restaurant, we had such a thing. She said, when I saw this assignment, I called my husband up. She said, we got to get this cheese. Let's get a bottle of wine. Let's watch the video at home. So we're creating, uh, we create that, which is fantastic. So, so let's take a, a quick uh, uh, look at um, uh, Jim Arnold here and what he does. But I want to wait until everybody gets their cheese. It's interactive. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really interactive. So, um, a little cheesy, but interactive. Anyway, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's just keep going. You'll, you'll get your cheese soon enough. And the ETC, they put all of this, uh, all the all the labeling goes in there. That's part of the package when you're doing this. Thank you, guys. Um, I hope you're hungry. As you can tell, brought breakfast for you. Um, I've got uh, a number of cheeses, and we're going to explore um, all the different kinds of cheese, uh, styles of cheese, textures, milks, different milks. We have goat's milk, sheep's milk, cow's milk, which is the, the big three. Um, passing around some information packets right here. And I made these very simplistic on purpose. Um, I just wanted to give you some good information uh, on uh, just cheese in general, and uh, didn't want to overwhelm you with a big stack of paperwork. Of course, if there's uh, uh, things about cheese that I maybe touch on that you're interested in, of course, uh, the internet is just a, a wonderful, wonderful resource. Uh, but I wanted to give you something that you could actually uh, uh, take physically with you. And I'm just going to go over this real quickly. Um, we're not going to read through it uh, word by word. But uh, on the first page, there's some categorical cheese terms. Uh, artisan cheese, farmhouse cheese. And then there's a little blurb on what raw milk and pasteurized cheeses uh, actually is. And then the second section here is basic cheese classifications. There's A quick two minute overview. He goes on for 90 minutes. But boy, talk about bringing the classroom to the student. Now. The student who got married and is telling her, her husband, let's have a cheese tasting, they went out and bought every single cheese and they ate along with the original class. What a clever idea. But I sure hope they watch those videos, you know? Do they watch them? Do they not? We were talking about rigor. How do we know? Okay? So this brings in the topic of discussion threads, okay? Linked to these videos, we created a required response in video discussion threads, okay? So we hold them accountable as to what was in the video. Discussion threads are questions created to stimulate online conversation. So since you saw the video and since you have the cheese, a lot of times we will, um, we will use discussion threads to help meet the learning outcomes of a specific class. So think about that. Um, so a, a, a good discussion thread should prompt the students to answer, okay? Discussion threads can be used to ensure that the required learning outcomes for the class can be achieved. So let's look at an example, okay? In our syllabus, this is really standard boilerplate coming right out of MSU. Uh, specific, uh, measurable student behavioral learning objectives are, okay? Discuss. <laughs> So in this class, discuss the sensory characteristics of food products. 
Identify selection principles of vegetables, fruits, dairy, you've got dairy today, uh, meats and seafood. So here is a learning outcome that was approved by the curriculum committee years ago. How do we do that in an online environment, okay? So the discussion thread for this assignment says, what was your opinion on the cheese demonstration video? And do you agree with Jim Arnold's description of the cheeses? This guy gave glowing descriptions of all the cheeses. Which cheeses have you eaten before and which have you never tried? And in the video, he did about 12 different cheeses. This question prompts a result. And when I don't get, if I get three sentences from the student, I go back I cut and paste this, I said, you're not answering the question. So again, there's that accountability factor that we talked about earlier.